Thank you. Thank you. Welcome again to this session. Thank you for making space in your lunch schedule. For the locals, it should be fairly early, but for the others, maybe I'll be starting to feel hungry. So my name is Gabriele Bunkela again. I work at Mathos, the makers of the MATLAB programming language. I've been there for about almost 12 years. Uh, I have a worldwide role as a product manager for our DSP and audio processing products. And this session is going to be about that. It's going to be about the application of deep learning techniques to signal processing and audio processing problems, or audio, speech, and acoustics. And I mean, if you, if you, how many of you have um, an experience of signal processing of some sort in the past, or something to do with audio? Kind of a rough show of hands. Okay, not many. But if you have it, and if, if you're in my position over the past years, You've see, you must have seen a, a kind of a big trend where uh, traditional techniques have been replaced by uh, a lot of new techniques based on machine learning and deep learning, starting from the most popular example, like the voice assistants, uh, to something that we try to see, we, we tend to see less, such as things like uh, mood classification systems in, in, in call centers, uh, the speaker verification, speaker identity verifications in your phone banking. Um, uh, systems and, uh, for example, for uh, public uh, services radio, uh, microphones to uh, complement the actions of vision and radio system in, in self-driving cars and, and a lot more. Um, you know, if you look at simple things like um, software for, um, for, for computer audio, you know, the typical things that are used to produce content, the content on TV, cinema, audio, uh, you find that even that community that used to be pretty anchored on traditional uh, signal processing method not only has been transitioning to using new methods based on deep learning, but also make a big deal of it in their technical marketing content. You know, they make statements where they call out deep learning techniques to make themselves visible and to differentiate a bit because, you know, that, that, that's also a market that's very competitive. So these are some examples. Audionomics over on the top left. They have software that very easily allows you to extract voice from mixed, pre-mixed content. Uh, they're based in France, Acusonica are based in Greece, and another example, they build uh, audio restoration software to take away noise or reverberation, again, from, from mixed content. And this is Isotope, a, kind of a much bigger company, not still, not talking, uh, you know, very large companies, but they have a several, um, several, several products that do tough things like take away the, the friction noise of microphones like these uh, from recording. These are all things that were not possible a long time ago, even if you look five, 10 years ago, or if they were possible, the quality was very low. And this new techniques have completely revolutionized uh, the way these things work these days. So there's a, there's a fundamental question that I'd like, like uh, us to answer during the session, and it's something like this. What does it take to develop an effective real-world machine learning system for audio and speech application? And when I say real-world, I, I mean something that works for real, something that you can sell, okay? And um, so I want to do it by, um, by using the example that's part closer to, to our daily life because you know, even, even the ones that are more traditional in the way they use electronics, have started to use voice to communicate maybe to your phone, maybe to other devices, right? And so, uh, and I want to be specific, I want to use the example of trigger word detection, which is a, a pretty important component in those systems. And let's, let's agree on what that is. Um, I just recorded myself here. Hey, Siri. So trigger word detections are those algorithms that allow uh, uh, phones, you know, every voice-enabled device to continuously listen for anything that happens around all the time, 24-7, and to wake up the system when they hit a keyword or a key phrase, okay? There are kind of, I like to think about those as the embedded gateway to your cloud-based voice assistance because these have to take place on the device. Uh, without that, uh, your phone cannot listen continuously stream audio to the cloud. That also means that everybody who wants to develop a voice interface needs to build their own. Well, you can leverage Alexa if you want, if you build your own device, but this you need to implement. So either you buy it and they tend to be pretty expensive or you develop it in-house. So what, what, what best to investigate uh, how something works and how difficult they try to make it? So what you're seeing right now is a, it's a prototype of a trigger word detector. Okay, I'm testing and it's a built prototype entirely in my lab. Word detector trained to wake up when it hears the word yes. I'd like my system to wake up whenever someone says yes, but obviously not when they speak any other random word that's not yes. 
So this is now working as a prototype. It's, it's an audio plugin running inside a kind of a very, very standard audio recording and, and, and editing software as, as a plugin. And so what I'd like to do during the session is to really show you how you put together something like that from the grounds up. Okay. And, and so if you uh, ask that question about this application, what could be the answer if you ask me that question? Well, rest assured that if you don't ask me, but you ask the majority of people that are involved with deep learning, uh, you'll get this as an answer. There's a deep neural network, that's the first thing. You might get even unluckier and get this kind of response back, which perhaps might make sense to some of you. To, to, to who, you know, show of hands, uh, who is able to uh, take some useful information from this second type of answer? Well, that's good. I mean, if you have some experience, this makes some sense. Otherwise, just some blurb. So this is, this is fair. It's definitely not wrong. Uh, but what I'd like you to take away in the next half hour or so is that there's a lot more to it. Okay, if you ask me, I would probably have mentioned at least this. A lot of data, a good dose of signal processing expertise, and tools built around speech and audio application. And you might wonder why so, right? If it's the neural network, what you need to do? Why, why do you need all those things? Well, let's find out. And at the end of the talk, let's reevaluate what's more important in the balance and what counts and where you can really make the difference in these applications. So uh, th this is really uh, important to me because what, where lies the important is it, it's, it, it really has an influence into understanding where the investment go, where the roles go. Should you hire a signal processing person or a computer scientist? And also, you know, there's, there's a lot of people complaining about it. Things are changing. Uh, my work perhaps is losing relevance. So let's find out. If you, this is taken from uh, an independent research that, that I, I came across a few months ago, and it's describing the amount of investment, you know, in terms of time and hours, uh, that goes into developing the actual models, so the, the networks, like finding out about possible architecture, training, and so forth, and working on the data to train that network. And if you look at research, somebody doing a PhD, this is the picture. Very little effort on data. Everybody reuses the same data and all goes in exploring the architecture of the system. But if you go to the industry, and I'm not just referring to audio and speech here, but in general, people pr developing product uh, sold as uh, powered by AI with deep learning inside, you'll find out that a lot of investment there are driven on data. And that's the requirements for shipping something that works, okay? Um, so wh what does that mean? That, I'll represent that using another picture as a that, that, we, that we tend to use. So if you think about the development of a deep learning system as a workflow, there's definitely a stage in that workflow where you need to design the network and train it, okay? But there's a lot happening earlier and after. So the first thing is to think after, what do I do with that? I need to implement it somewhere. For the kind of problem that we, are, we have in hand here, I need to make it run on a phone, for example. But then it's, a, it's, it's how do I train it? And there's a lot going on inside. So here, to schematize, there's a first uh, stage where the data that, needs, that it's used to train the network needs to be processed in some way to make it digestible, understandable by the network. And there's a lot to know about uh, collecting the data, annotating it, augmenting it, and so forth. So I'll try to cover uh, you know, here and there uh, the various stages of this process. So let's see. This is, this is the order in which I'll cover that. So I'll start you know, by taking the elephant of the room out of the equation, does discuss what you need to do about designing the network, choosing what network to, to, to use and, and how to go about it. Uh, and then I'll, 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 I'll talk a bit about the data that you need to start with, and, and in particular annotation or labeling. Uh, I'll talk about synthesizing or augmenting data and about extracting feature for, for data, okay? And then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Right, so let's start from the basics. Uh, how do you, um, what's the idea about training a network? Most of you might know, but let, let's recap it. Um, a network is, or kind of a deep learning system or a neural network is a system that, just like any type of machine learning, learns from data and learns to produce an, an answer from data. So it's fed with some inputs, some expected outputs, and after you know, adjusting its behavior based on the accuracy or non accuracy its response, it's optimized in order to then produce an, uh, an optimized model, a trained model, that can then, once new data is available, predict the right kind of output from the data that it hasn't seen before. The first phase, we call it training. The second, we might call it prediction of inference. You know, they're, they're pretty much equivalent uh, terms. Um, so in, when, you, um, so when you think about networks, um, 
one type of, of ways to think about them these days, especially, is about thinking about layers. So this, I'll, I'll use very few snaps of code during the presentation. Uh, it will be MATLAB code. In this particular case, you can find the network that I use in that system that you saw. Uh, it, don't, don't lose time reading about the details, but take away that it's a vector of layers, right? And if you know what layers you, you, you need, and if you know how to, how to call them in MATLAB, you can go ahead and, and, and look it up and form a, a vector, okay? And um, why, why layers? Well, kind of that's a way of representing these uh, connections of neurons. Uh, they originally, they were biologically inspired, and a convenient way of, 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 of building networks was, was about thinking about stacks of these neurons and connect them together. And by doing that, you come up with a number of parameters that you need to optimize, or using training to have the right answer answer given an input. Okay, these days uh, layers might appear in literature in different ways because the way they work, the math behind them evolved. It evolved, you know, the way you optimize them evolved. And no, you know, there's this, this various ways of representing same things. Like this slice represents a typical ways of representing convolutional neural networks, for example. And this other, it's a, it's a common way of representing LSTM, so long short term memory layers, which are the ones that were used in the example that are. Um, that we use. These are sometimes, you know, these belong to a larger class of uh, recursive neural networks. Okay, so uh, let's 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 get back to our example. How do I choose uh, what kind of layers to use? Well, I think chances are, if you're developing a product, that's that's a that's a problem that's been discussed and examined in literature. This is just a, a snap. Uh, of, of example taken from from Google. I'm not endorsing any of these in particular, but it's just to give the, give the idea. If you if you are after an example, especially even in this area in computer vision, not, not even to mention, the literature abounds with uh, with with example of networks that could work well in that case. So the general consensus is just grab the first that you got under your eyes, provided you're able to implement it, and then you've got margins for improving it in in, in all terms. Okay. So what you can see here in this case is speech applications and a lot of mentions of LSTM, uh, LSTM layers between three and four layers, the kind of things that we're using, right? So the, the, the kind of thing that we had there. Obviously, you know, using the language right away when you're new to the problem may be a bit nasty. You don't know what those functions are. You don't know how to find them. So and other approaches in general, uh, there are apps or there are drag and drops that may be useful as an entry level where you just have a look at catalog of layers available in that framework. You drag and drop them into a canvas, connect them, and have your model, okay? Uh, similarly, when you design the network, it's important to see, once you've designed it, how many parameters are there that you'll need to optimize when you do training? How complex is your model? The more complex the model, the more data you will need. And you see that in this case, you know, maybe people who, who are new to deep learning tend to see those couple of layers of LSTM and think, oh, come on, this is not deep. Back in the 80s, when I first started neural network, we had networks with two internal layers. Well, in this case, look at the, the thousands of weights that you're, you, you're bound to have to, um, to optimize in this case. So now, so you have your network. Um, optimizing these days means definitely not writing the equations for gradient descent and finding yourself, but it, it, it's about using um, a framework, whatever that is. Uh, in this, whatever framework will give you a way to specify the network or to specify some parameters that you want to use to adjust the way the network trains or optimizes the value of the weights. And then once you have the network design and the training options, you just go ahead and call a common like this one, train network that takes the, the, the architecture, the specifications, inputs and expected outputs, and goes ahead uh, probably using some, some hardware like a GPU and optimizes uh, the network. And, and, and you'll see something like that. This is a common type of representation of the level of optimization of the system that represents the accuracy, not over time, but over, over training cycle, okay? And what you're definitely happy when those lines go oh, up and to the right because it, 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 it means that you, we can, you're coming close to 100% accuracy. That means that the network predi predicts the right responses for every uh, input. Uh, and, and at the end, you've got your train network, okay? Like, say, look at this example. Uh, this is telling us that by using a single GPU for training, uh, it took five minutes to train the system, and we kind of got an accuracy of 90%. It means nine times over 10, the network gave the right, the right answer for this problem in hand. And this is right the, the, the plot that you would see if you train that, um, that network that uh, I'm presenting here. Right, so validation accuracy. Let me use this as an important point to segue. Two lines here. 
a blue and a dashed dotted line. Okay? These are telling us two different bits of information. The blue tell us the accuracy on the data that we're actually using to optimize the weights of the network. Okay? That is data that is going actually into the computations. There's another bit of data that's not going on the computation, but it's, it's always kept handy as a means of checking. It's data that's not used to optimize the weights, but it's used to check how the weights are doing. That's data that the network's never seen before, but it's not used for training. And so that tells us usually how the network behaves for a real problem. Most likely, that validation data will be data that's very close to the data that the final system will be seeing. Okay? Data that's realistic, that takes into account the defects of any microphone that we'll be using, the acoustic responses of the room, that's the data that we present. That's telling us something. How, are, how is our network behaving for the final problem that we're giving it? Okay? Whereas the training set is something else. So let's use this distinction. Let's keep it in mind because it will accompany us through quite a few parts of this talk. And let's move on and use this as a segue to, to think about how you, you go about, we go about annotating data. Because we, we talk about data and labels, but you know, data uh, aren't born with labels. Either you take data with labels from somebody else, or you'll need to record data and put a label onto it. And so labeling data uh, these days has a different meaning to me for training and, and validation data. And so I want to just give you some, some bits of information to, to let you think about it. Back in the days, I mean, if you're in between your 30s and 40s now and you were in school in your 20s, if you study any deep learning in school, then you will be told the following. You've got this much data, okay, that's all you've got, and you need to train a system with that, a machine learning system. So making sure that you chop your data in three parts. The largest part, you use it for training, we said, to actually optimize the weights of the network. And then you've got other two parts. The second part you'll use for validation, the one that we've seen, the black line. Okay? And then there will be another part used to test. Why another part if the validation was already telling us that the network, if the, well, how the network was behaving? Well, because if the network is, is not behaving well, we're likely to change something in the network, like some options in the training, for example, or, or some other parameters. So although that data doesn't come directly into the optimization. We're using it to inform us in choices. So we are likely to adjust the parameters so the network behaves well on the data. So once we're happy at the stage where we need a, kind of a, a verification the network was well on data that it really hasn't had any impact in, in, in how it's behaving, and that's the role of the test data, right? And at the time, so these two used uh, during training, this afterwards, at the time, you know, 60%, 20%, 20%, 70 15 15 this was the kind of ballpark, okay? But, the, you know, this is largely a recipe of kind of a, a textbook recipe. Uh, and that was what worked well when, you, you know, the size of the data set were between kilobytes and megabytes, so the traditional size. But now with modern systems, so many weights and so much data needed to train them, the picture is changing. Uh, data is exploding in amount. But if you shrink it down to the same proportion, you find out that the training the part of the data will be over 90%, will be 98% typically, something like that, or, or, or close, 95. And you use just a tiny bit of the data for validation and training. Hold on, I said tiny in proportion. This will be probably a lot more than you used to have in your old machine learning problem, but in comparison with, with, with a whole budget of data, this will be tiny, okay? So, uh, what does that mean? Is that the kind of things that you, you can do on your data actively in terms of investment vary a lot. It's very difficult to intervene on the training data because that's huge. Who you are, what are the resources to go and work and correct the training data. But you have a lot more margin to work and correct the validation data. Okay, so let's start from it. Let's give you some examples in terms of what you can do. So what's a good type of, of, of validation data with some labels for our problem? Remember, our problem is to wake up whenever there's a word yes. So this is an example. Um, let me play it first. Uh, it's a recording. First you said yes, then no, then you said yes, then no, then yes, then no. Driving me crazy. All right. I like this signal because there is, uh, there is a voice, there's a speech, there's a recording, but there's a lot more. There's some washing machine noise in the background. There's a little reverberation. Uh, let's assume that this is a realistic uh, recorded signal. It, it's something good, it's representative of, of the actual work and environment of my future product. So I like that. The other thing that I like is that kind of, uh, the kind of mask, let's call it, that highlights only the, the, the errors of the recording where I have the word yes. 
And I feed that, the red, as a label to the network because I need the network to wake up whenever there's a transition from, from zero to one, okay? And, and, and let's listen just to those portions to make sure that this is well labeled. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so no extra, no less. It kind of sounds, sounds about right. How do we achieve this? Okay, so this to me is, is a good validation data sample because it's, it's got a realistic recording and it's also accurately labeled. So realistic recording, it's okay. You are developing the system. You might have a prototype. You know what microphones you're using. You can use it and go where you need to record the data. Data, raw data is easy to record. What about labeling? Okay, so various approaches. Uh, how to label? Well, in general, is use an intelligent system trained to carry out a similar task with proven accuracy, right? You are developing a system, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist a system that does it better. Maybe it's a cloud system, uh, or maybe it's a human. You know, that's the first choice. That's still how many people label data. The people who sell you the data most, uh, most times have uh, warehouses of work and are just remote workers that label that data. How do they work? Well, they use apps uh, that are made to label data. This is just an example of an app that's recently been um, uh, shipped in MATLAB. It's called Audio Labeler. I am testing a prototype of a wake-up word detector so you trained kind of to wake up when it hears the word yes. Okay, you can kind of yes, stop, go back, zoom in, and making sure that you label it as something that you're looking for. It can be yes, it can be true, it can be up. But you yes. select only the area where there's yes, you validate it, you click down into the label area, type whatever you want that corresponds to that, uh, adjust the, the section, and then you move on, right? So that's the first uh, way to do that. Uh, it's kind of, it's, it tends to be onerous. It's important to have it, because sometimes you need to go in and correct the labels, but it's, it's, a, it's a bit, you know, you can't bet on really delivering a full uh, label data set with, with, a, with a manual approach. So then the second option is to use an automated system, like an intelligent system. Uh, so a pre-trained machine learning model, what does that look like? So for example, you know, for, for speech, uh, there's, there's various uh, services available out there, uh, like Google Speech, used in this case from that same app, but they're, they're similar from Amazon, IBM, you, um, you name it. And, and so, so the ability to just call out to a system like that, that's not exactly labeling data according to your needs. In this case, it's, it's labeling whatever, all, all the words, but it's giving you the time intervals for all the words. So you can label all your collections, your files, just by sending them to the way and getting them back. You can see that every word is, is highlighted in isolation. And then because you have uh, some programming experience, it doesn't, things don't need to be exactly like you need them but you can post-process it by writing some code. In this case, those labels, in terms of the value and the time intervals can be exported into MATLAB, so you can just, you have them here represented as a table, uh, so that there you go. You can select only the rows where there's yes, having only the intervals where there's yes, and, and wherever you encounter yes, um, you know, start from zeros, where I encounter yes, put a one, and pretty easily using a combination of intelligent services and a language that you can control, you can get to a situation like this, where... Uh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes, 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 okay, yes, yes. I know, I, I, I didn't completely plan that this would be so funny once, once, once played back in public. <laughs> But it's the, the idea is that we understood, you know, playing it back, the only selected area, it's a, just a good way to, to check that this is well validated, okay? So this is the general, the general rule. So this, is, this is a good way to, to go about uh, labeling um, validation data. What to say about training? Well, you know, for training, uh, unless normally you, uh, you tend to accumulate data sets, multiple data sets that are already labeled. So the idea is usually still to use a programmatic approach to use the information that you have, but revert it into the form that you that you need. I won't, you know, we had just limited bandwidth in terms of time, I won't go too deep, but I use training just as, again as a segue, because the problem with training data is not only that the labels need to be accurate, but training data inherently won't be specific to your problem, even in the way it's being recorded, okay? So uh, th there's, there's a new problem about training, which is that the data is different from the one that your system will digest in the end, okay? It will be data typically, uh, let me go directly to the slide, record it at, at, at- First you said yes, then no, then you said yes. At a desk, right? 
uh, with, with a little mic, a headset, like you, it's, it's who, who, who knows where, with what microphones, at what point in time, but what person, in what mood, you don't know. You have this data, you need to make some use of it. And let's assume that the labels, you're in a good place. That's label data and you're able to convert them into the format that you need, like in this case, a mask over time. How do you make sure that you can make your training data a little bit more similar to your validation? So when you train your network, you you're not just randomly expected that magically your network behaves well in your validation data, but you can help it. Well, the only way to do it is to take your data and try to bring it closer to the validation data, make it more real, okay? Uh, this is an example of more realistic First data. First you said yes, then no, then you said yes. Okay, the, the, the kind of thing we had before, so reverberation and, and noise background, take all the variations that you, uh, that you want. How do you do that? Well, some people call this synthesis, some others call it augmentation. I like augmentation because synthesis supposes you don't have anything and then you come up, you invent stuff. Augmentation is more suitable to audio, speech, and acoustics because you normally you want to start with something. You don't just synthesize data at random, but then you have a way to augment it. So let's take a look at the, the possible things that you can do. Um, You've got um, uh, one. If you got this, two, three. Okay, this recorded signal, you know, a lot, very muffled, very fast reach, but also very dry and reverberation, and, and a lot of uh, electrical noise. So one of the things you can do, well, add, for example, one, two, add reverberation. Three. How do you add reverberation? Well, you, you can measure the behavior of acoustical systems, and you can combine them together. You can have many. Um, one. You can record noise Two. that's relevant to your situations Three. of use. And if you want to avoid applying these effects on background noise that's specific to that recording, so for example, reverberating the electrical noise would be a pretty nasty thing to do because it wouldn't happen in reality. Well, you can use One. clean up algorithms, Two. Uh, either you know, that you write yourself, available in the MATLAB toolboxes or any other system, or you can use external API. MATLAB these days, for example, you can consume easily audio plugins. And you know, one of those guys at the beginning that did um, audio restoration tools, I was able to easily use their plugins to clean up uh, the audio in preparation for a post-processing like reverberation. There, there are th other things that I've done specifically for speech often. So for example, um, yes, this is the original. Yes. And this is, you can do time stretching. That means the same pitch taking more or less time to play. It's a bit tricky to implement, but it's a common standard effect. You know, it's, it's made to account the fact when people speak faster or slower, okay, starting from a single sample. Similar thing, pitch shifting. Yes. Okay, accounting where people are just more relaxed or, or, or more depressed or, or happier or in a hurry or, or the opposite, okay? Things like time stretching, sound doesn't, doesn't change, but it allows you to make the network more responsible to different positions based on how it scans the signal. Uh, it's clear that, um, th th that yes. there's some domain expertise required. You know, things like pitch shifting, and uh, you can do it in different ways. So, you know, th there's a brutal way of doing pitch shifting and the non-brutal way. You know, this is the original yes. way, again. Yes. This is a pretty good way. Yes. This is a bad way. So, the last two. Yes. Yes. Okay, same pitch, strictly the same pitch, but in some way, in, in the first way to the right, it's the same person talking with a lower pitch, but with the same shape of the vocal tract. In the other case, it's the equivalent of a, of a, of, of a giant replica of the same version with a big vocal tract. So uh, the, 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 that is trivial, that's not trivial. Okay, so you, you need to pay attention to do things the right way or you're just messing about and train your network on rubbish stuff. Okay, so, um, we covered that. Let's take a look at the last topic, which is creating input for the networks. There's, a, th there's some misconceptions around deep learning, which is you have a network and you just need to feed it raw data because it will be so intelligent and so self-sufficient that it will make sense of your data regardless of how many samples per second it is, how complex and how abstract, right? That's a misconception. Uh, that what you call feeding raw data to a network has a name and it's called end-to-end -end learning. And it wouldn't be right to say that it's nothing to do with deep learning. It's got something to do with deep learning, but it's not deep learning. Historically, deep learning in some, with some types of signal has been able to produce end-to-end -end learning. It doesn't happen so often with, with audience speech. The only example that I've got in, in, in mind that works well doing end-to-end -end learning is Google's WaveNet. 
no more. That's not what people do, okay? Everybody, regardless of the type of layers that the network is made of, will do some kind of pre-personal data. So that means that you have various, you know, large data sets composed of data samples and labels uh, for convolutional networks typically, because they, are, they're, they're, they were born in the first place to work with images, you transform, you transform the, 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 the audio or the signal into some form of spectrograms. That means uh, frequency over time. There will be slices with frequency transformed. This is also called short time Fourier transform. And then you'll feel that through the network. That's a possible way of, of pre-processing the data. Uh, the other way is that there are uh, specific features that are, there are some that are very useful speech or other domains that basically takes some measurement of estimation of the data that we know makes sense. Uh, typically, there's an invariance problem behind extracting features in that you want to have the same features when you apply some modification on the data that do don't change its, its substance, substance. So there's a lot of liter literature on those. So that's, that's the way to go. Um, and, and again, deep learning doesn't mean end-to-end -end learning. So uh, I, for, for the few who have some, some single person experience, this will make some sense, so I'll, I'll go quick. I'll just give you an example of typical things that are used. And, and in this particular example, it, they represent different stages of, a, of the say of one end goal, but you can feed any of these stages. So for example, starting from the, the initial signals over time, the first thing you do is to you, you, you buffer it or window it, you slice it, and then you do the same thing on, on all the slices and you stack it together. The first thing you can do, it's a spectrogram or, or, or a simple a short time Fourier transform. Those are FFTs uh, stacked uh, one next to the other. Um, another kind of more refined step that you can take is to weight that FFT. The FFT is, is, is an artificial construction. It doesn't reflect how the human ear sounds and how voice have evolved to be well perceived by the ear. So there's this perceptually accurate versions of spectrogram that, that take various names, for example, the MEL spectrogram. These are perceptually scaled time frequency representation. And again, from this, another very useful thing that's computed is, is this uh, feature called um, MFCC, MEL frequency capstral coefficients. These, I, I, I just meant to put this slide so there were some, some, some keywords that might resonate uh, with, with, with some of you. Right, so. Now, remember this slide at the beginning, we're talking about the two phases, training and, 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 and inference and prediction. How do things l look like when you put them all together? How do you do training? So you will have a collection of recordings with the right labels, okay? And we've just seen that we use typically some kind of feature extraction to transform or reduce the amount of information in, in some way. That has the effect, let, let's, let's talk bluntly, to allowing you to use uh, you know, less heavy networks uh, so you don't need, uh, so, so you, they're trained in, in, a reasonably, uh, in a reasonable amount of time or resources, right? Uh, even Google will uh, uh, advise against using uh, WaveNet for any kind of practical problem because the training times are so completely out of scale compared to the usage time. It takes a day to train it for one minute. It's ridiculous. So n not even mention embedded systems, right? So. Um, then, then you use the features along with the labels to train the network, okay? You'll feed the features and, and the features over time to the network, and then you, that's how the network will, will, be, will be optimized. Because we saw that almost always we also need to, 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 to pay augmentation, that means that the, the, the feature will be extracted on the augmented data, right? So wh where you end up there may be larger or smaller than the original data, depending on, on, on what you do, but this is the general workflow, okay, for training. So there's a lot going on. Things look a lot easier for inference, right? Once you, you don't need to augment, the network is already trained. I forgot to update the cars. Those are meant to be uh, field weights adapted. And the idea is that you just take the input signal, you extract the features out of it, uh, you feed it to the network, and you expect to find back at the end the right type of inference, okay? When you put it into code, this looks quite simple. So there's a, this, this is a, a sample, uh, it's, it's slight code, so there's, there's obviously more code here, but you can see the bit of code to extract MFCCs and repartition them in, in, a, in a way that are digestible. Uh, one line of code to have a network that's pre-trained and let it have predict an output signal. And then in this case, um, some, you know, some logic to insert um, the, the trigger sound, stuff like that. This, I was saying that there's, there's, there's a lot more, uh, there's, there's you know, there's various parameters in terms of how you accumulate the data, what latency, et cetera, but you know, let's not go into the details there. Uh, and so, so by doing that, I just, I think I covered all these aspects. This, the, this, the bottom's contact, which is how do, we, how do we end up building that kind of application, that demo that you saw at the beginning, and that was, um, that was done in, in, in this way. So, well, yeah, 
we did cover all of this pretty much, at least not all, not all but, but a good sampling with this kind of augmentation, labeling, transformation, physical extraction, et cetera. But what about the last slice there? How do you take a bit of code that you used as an investigation process, uh, yeah, the research and development, and, and change it into a product, or at least a prototype that can be tested in the real world? And so this is just a kind of a, a, a few slides just to uh, take away the curiosity for, for that demo you saw. Uh, if you started with that piece of code, imagine that that and, and all that sits around saved to, to, to a file, to a MATLAB file in this case. Uh, this is one of the many ways that MATLAB can transform a piece of uh, MATLAB code into C or C++. Uh, there are other avenues as well. In this particular way, it already allows you to take that code and transform it into a plugin. So what was running underneath that plugin was, was compiled C++, including all the network. Uh, so something like that. This was uh, this was the the, the source C++ in a juice project. In case this you're familiar with that, and that 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 basically was what was running in there. So so it was running uh, pretty pretty well in real time. Not too many issues. And these networks can also be scaled very easily. Instead of having 150 uh, units per layer, you could have 50, and it worked uh, just about fine. Okay. So. What's the, the answer to that question? It's summarized form. What do I need to develop such a system? Obviously, a simple and proven deep network recipe is, 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 is one part of the answer, which was the equivalent of the deep, uh, the deep network. That's fine. But I think the, 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 the bulk of the answer to me was you need a lot of awareness and expertise uh, in terms of how things work, which means that all the competencies, the skills, the tools, the expertise, that uh, signal processing engineers in this case have accumulated over years are still valuable, and, and they're still valuable even to train deep networks. And this is what happens in, in, in companies that do these things for real, not just for research, but uh, everything that uh, you find in your, in your, in, in your phone, uh, you don't even know who's developing it, uh, because likely your phone manufacturer don't want you to know. But what they will be doing is, is this kind of things, okay? And the bottom line to me is deep learning system can only be as good as the data used to train them. There's no way to get away from it, right? And that should be the end for me. <laughs>